and welcome to The Context. I'm John Barron. This week, with interest rates heading up again, we're looking at the great Australian dream of home ownership. So, let's get out of the studio and get out of the ABC altogether and go somewhere with, you know, houses. Around 100 years ago, these were pretty typical Australian homes. Nothing too fancy, a frangipani out the front, dunny out the back, not enough room to play a game of cricket, doesn't matter, play it in the back lane. They were modest houses, but they were close to the city and close to work. In the middle of last century, Australian government saw home ownership as a key to social cohesion as well as economic security. Around one third of mortgages came from state or federal governments through programs like the War Service Loan. A five pound or ten dollar deposit was all it took. The future of this or any nation is bound up in the dignity of its family life. Here is the very core of our well-being. The foundation for the years of vast development which are to come. A sturdy roof to live under, a patch of ground, trees and the fresh clean wind. There is much to be done before every family can enjoy a home of their own. Over the years, the Australian dream got bigger. Suburbs sprawled and so did the size of our homes. But most of all, what really got bigger was the price. The stark fact is that, rightly or wrongly, more and more young Australians are seeing that great Australian dream fading away. Mortgage increases... Hang on. Where have I heard this somewhere before? before? The stark fact is that, rightly or wrongly, more and more young Australians are seeing that great Australian dream fading away. Mortgage increases, the deposit gap, all are having a psychological impact on our aspirations of home ownership. So this housing crisis isn't exactly new, but this time it is a bit different. The reason some homeowners were struggling back in the early 1980s was that mortgage interest rates had hit 12.5%. By 1990, the Reserve Bank rate climbed to a peak of 17.5% in the aftermath of the 1987 Wall Street crash and as a result of policy settings from the Hawke Keating government. Ah, Paul, I thought these damn fool things were supposed to go up. We keep filling the thing with hot air. Don't get your glands in a knot, Bob. It'll be a soft landing. So, is it more expensive to buy a house these days? At the start of the 1980s, the median Australian house price was around $74,000. Adjust that for inflation, and that's the equivalent of about $350,000 today. Back then, men working full-time earned an average of $16,000 a year and women, 12,500. If the family was living on just the man's income, the house cost the equivalent of 4.6 years wages, or based on the woman's income alone, it was just under six years. And if they both worked full time, it was 2.6 years. Again, adjusted for inflation, and that median house price stayed pretty steady until the early 2000s, when it jumped dramatically. Then it rose more gradually in the 2010s before spiking again over the past two years during the pandemic property boom. So while it took just 2.6 years of a man and woman's combined wages to buy a house in the 80s, that ratio has ballooned to over eight and a half years of total household income today. On the other hand, when mortgage rates went above 17%, those comparatively smaller loans still got pretty expensive. In 1980, average mortgages took 35% of income to repay. A decade later, and home loans were eating up half of all household income. Now it's somewhere in between at 41%. But as interest rates continue to head up, so will the chunk of income home loans take up. And experts say anything above 30% puts you at risk of mortgage stress. And that overall lack of affordability has seen the proportion of people living in a home they own with or without a mortgage fall from 71% to 66% in the first two decades of the 21st century. That's down to its lowest level since the mid-1950s. 
So, we've seen that buying a home has become a lot more expensive, but why has it happened? And are there things that government could be doing or could stop doing to make things any easier? What we need is an expert on housing policy and planning. Ah, here's one. Nicole Garren, welcome to The Context. Why is it that homes are so much more expensive now than they were in the 1980s? Yeah, good question. Simple answer is that when people can pay more for housing, they tend to do so. And so we had a couple of big structural changes between the 1980s and today. And probably the biggest one was that household incomes increased. And the biggest increase was actually due to women's participation in the workforce. So we had household incomes rising, wages also rose over that period of time, but finance was actually really difficult to get. When that changed, in a period known as financial deregulation, when mortgages were much easier to obtain, and then after that, interest rates started to fall, all of a sudden people could pay a lot more for housing, and governments encouraged them to do so. So we also saw some big tax benefits associated particularly with property investment. So landlords were encouraged to buy houses on the promise of capital gain, not long-term rental return. And so again, that helped to bid up the price of housing and take us to the place we are today. So if house prices went up to an extent because we were prepared and able to pay more for houses, at what point did it get out of hand and out of reach for people that were not already in the housing market and suddenly finding they weren't able to get into it. Yeah, that's actually been occurring over a 20 year period of time. There's been a lot of research that looks at actually the age at which people enter first home ownership and that's been dropping off over the past two decades. So we've seen younger people, particularly younger lower income workers who you know, in the 1980s were certainly in home ownership even by their mid 20s, many of them. We've seen that figure fall off a cliff and particularly today. But also disturbingly, we've started to see in the past decade in particular, older people actually falling out of home ownership as well. So we've seen people following a separation or a change in their life, also falling off the housing ladder and being unable to get back in. So a real case of the haves and have nots. Good news, if you're in a, a million dollar house and you want to go into a $1.3 million house, it's not that hard. But what about for those who are now contemplating what high interest rates could mean because maybe it's your parents or your grandparents generation but people can remember 17 percent suddenly that becomes really hard to repay. That's right look interest rates have started to rise economists don't expect them to rise the astronomical heights that they did in the early 90s late 80s but even the small rises that we're likely to, comparatively small rises that we're likely to see will mean a lot of pain for households who've taken on, particularly people who've bought recently, who've taken on much bigger mortgages than ever before. And we can see even the results of the 2021 census show that in cities like Sydney, for instance, the proportion of households already in 2021, before interest rates started to rise, who are paying more than 30% of their income on their mortgage was around 20%. Now that figure is undoubtedly higher now and it will rise and that will mean a lot of a, a lot of pain for those households. Those high interest rates in that brief period in the late 80s, early 90s you talk about also saw property prices plateauing and falling in, in many parts of the country for several years. Can we expect that if interest rates go up a little bit, not up to 17%, that there will be a, either a plateauing or a falling? We certainly will see prices start to cool and as affordability pressures bite. What we won't see most likely is a tumbling of house prices unless other economic factors occur. For instance, if there's another economic shock that means widespread unemployment, then that will cause you know, the bottom to really fall out of the housing market. But we will certainly see house prices moderate. We're likely to see sellers perhaps not put their houses to market you know, until they can reach the prices that they might have expected. Um, but there will be some changes, that's true. It seems that whenever governments get involved in this space, whether it's through tax settings around negative gearing or first home buyers grants or, or now shared equity schemes and so on, somebody puts up their hand and says, you're just going to drive the prices up even more. Of those various interventions, are there ones that you can say do have a positive impact on affordability? 
Unfortunately, those demand side tools that you mentioned, so incentives for property investment like negative gearing and there are other tax, tax benefits associated with investing in housing, even first home buyers grants and construction grants, they do have a demand side impact on housing and you'd think for all the talk about housing affordability that they were actually designed to maintain high um, house prices. What we need to be doing is shifting towards policies that stimulate new and affordable housing supply. And what that means is investing in social and affordable housing. It means tipping incentives towards investment in long-term, secure, affordably, affordably priced rental housing. And it can mean shared equity models as well to enable affordable home ownership, but only when those models are linked to new affordable housing supply. We've seen that back in the 1950s, governments were a lot more involved with the provision of subsidised mortgages as a, as a benefit to return servicemen and women, a lot more happening at the state level through housing uh, programs, housing commissions, clearing of slums, sending people out to the suburbs, all of those kinds of things. Would you go back to that now or does the future demand different solutions? Back to the future in terms of housing policy, you're right. When we look at housing policy in the 50s and 60s, even all the way up to the mid 90s, it seems like a different um, period of time entirely. There was a real belief that government did have a role in correcting market failures in the housing system. And we seem to have lost that entirely. We seem to have, we've been on a 40 year experiment which is that the market can fix all of our housing problems. Now it clearly can't unless rising problems of homelessness even amongst people who work, unless rising rental housing affordability and mortgage stress, unless that's the agenda, it's really clear that the market isn't going to fix housing problems and governments do need to intervene. And they can look to some of the things that they did you know, 50 years ago, even 30 years ago, which was number one, investing in social and affordable housing. Number two, we saw governments actually much more engaged in producing new housing supply for the market, particularly in terms of releasing land with infrastructure in a way that was sufficient to actually ensure an ongoing pipeline of affordable sites for housing development. We also saw adequate levels of rental subsidy where that was needed. And we did see policies that were targeted to enable people to get into home ownership who might not otherwise have been able to do so, which is particularly important right now. But with whatever government intervention we choose, we need to make sure that we're not continuing to inflate housing demand, but actually we're creating a long-term secure form of affordable housing both to purchase but also to rent. Given that we are now seeing a higher proportion of people renting than the, since the 1950s, what impact is that having on the rental market, the fact that you've got a lot of people who are uh, wanting to buy, uh, trying to save aggressively, but in the meantime they're renting for perhaps an extra 10 years to what a previous generation might have? Yeah, there's been a lot of research on that, particularly carried out by the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute over a 20 year period and that shows real structural change in the private rental sector and what we see is more moderate and even high income earners remaining in the private rental sector which has expanded to to absorb them but that means more competition for more affordably priced rental stock and so that has a squeezing out effect for people at the bottom of the rental market which is why we hear stories of single people, older women, even you know cleaners and key workers in many towns as well as our central um, business districts being able to afford homes you know that are decently priced near where they work. Nicole Garron, great to talk to you. Thanks for being with us on The Context. Thanks very much, John. Time for Now and Then. And how have Australian attitudes towards home ownership changed over the last 40 years? Here's Ange Lavoie-Pierre. Hi, can I ask you a quick question? Excuse me. No, don't run. And now for the one to $2 million question. Is the great Australian dream of owning your own home still alive. 
I think it's a lovely dream, but unfortunately it's looking more and more like just a dream. A no, dream. <laughs> a dream, but that's about it because of the way the interest rates are going on there. It's very unattainable, so it seems more like a joke than a dream now. What does the house mean to you? Well, when you've never had your own home before, it's a good feeling. Well, I think it would be pretty cool to have my own place because um, renting and like staying in shared houses is not like sustainable. Yeah, excuse me, son. A lot of a lot of families, um, the husband works two jobs, or one works seven seven days, seven days a week. I spent years out in the mines to get my, you know, money together. And this is the only place where you can for a secure job. But if you try to get, you know, get ahead down here, you're going to have to stay in a caravan. I think there shouldn't be any homes in the place. You all should live in ten and live in three houses and let all the trees grow. <laughs> so, having seemingly reached a crisis point, where do we go from here? Hey, Jesse, how do you feel about the great Australian dream of home ownership? What can our politicians and the bureaucrats do to save the great Australian dream from becoming a nightmare? No stamp duty on your first home double stamp duty if you buy a subsequent property. We don't have good rental arrangements like in Europe. Like in Europe you get 20, 20 year leases, that doesn't happen here. Yeah. So we're condemning a whole bunch of people to insecurity unless they can own a home. So we either need to change one rental or the other home ownership access. It's pretty sad actually, like unless you have like parents backing you up or like some inheritance. It is depressing, it really is. At the moment it's not possible for me. It's just too expensive. Um, I don't make enough money. The quality of life has gone. Bye, Mama. It's just simply gone. Hello. This is supposed to be the lucky Hello. country. Bye, Mom. Yes, mate. This is supposed to be the lucky country, and it isn't any longer. Like, Gotta have hope. Gotta have hope. Gotta have hope. Yeah. Hope right. and love is what gets you through. All right. Yeah. Oh, if hope and love could get you houses, I feel like a lot more people would own homes. <laughs>so if you're saving up to buy your first home renting is an alternative it's also the option of course if you're never going to be in a position to buy your own home problem of course with renting is after 25 years you still don't own a home or an appreciating asset and that becomes a particular problem as we get older what we need is an expert on property and older people ah uh, here's one dr lois towett from the university of technology welcome to the context Thank you, my pleasure. What would you say are the major implications of having, whether it's more and more Australians reaching retirement age as renters or uh, owing a lot more on some of these big mortgages they're signing? It actually creates a very complex policy environment as well because what you've got, as we've seen in the recent census, is just how diverse older Australians are. And to say that we have a problem, you know, certainly for a person who does achieve retirement age and doesn't own a house, it can actually be very problematic in areas which have got high rental costs. Try living on the pension and paying you know, market rent in Sydney. It is very, you know, for the age pension, it is very difficult. So consequently, you've got those problems there. But on the other token, you've got a lot of Australians who a lot of their, their personal wealth is tied up in their housing assets. So you've got those issues within the total property market, which makes any blanket one size fits all policy exceedingly difficult from the point of view of government. What are the flow and effects of higher property values on the, the ageing and retirement sector, whether it is people looking to buy into retirement villages or assisted living, or even the higher bonds that are being charged to go into uh, more high levels of nursing care, those sorts of things? Well, the biggest implication actually isn't the higher values. What has actually been happening, particularly in the retirement living and aged care industry, is the increased longevity of Australians. You know, when I started working in the industry several decades ago, somebody over 80 was considered to be somewhat old. Nowadays, people don't start thinking about moving into a retirement village until they're pretty much close to 80, um, or at least their late 70s. People in their 90s are still considered quite sprightly. Most nursing homes or residential aged care, they don't often start celebrating the, the older birthdays until people turn 100. So it's actually really how that's had implications for how people choose to downsize and when they choose to downsize. That's had a, a significant flow on impact to you know, how older people use their housing. What about more novel styles of housing? I don't know about you, but I've had a number of conversations with friends, maybe at the end of a fairly long meal, you think, 
we should all live together when we're really old and we could pay for a, a doctor or nurse to be on site and oh, it'd be terrific, it'd be much better than being in a nursing home. Are those kinds of blended households going to be a part of the future, do you think? Those types of households have existed for some time. They are few and far between. And one of the reasons they're often few and far between is though that they're a great idea, certainly after I sound, you, sounds like you had a few too many red wines as well. <laughs> um, they were a great idea then, let's all live together. The actual turning it into reality becomes quite difficult. It's the legal setting up is one thing, it's the legal unwinding that becomes another issue. So, because somebody has to own it, or what happens when somebody dies, what are the principal barriers? Yeah, it's, it's all that unwinding it. What happens if somebody needs to, you know, as I sort of said, somebody becomes quite frail and needs quite advanced medical care. How do we unwind it then? Those sorts of issues, we need to find somebody else to move in. We all like each other, we need to find another like-minded individual to move in. So that may not be as, as easy to be obtained as to that initial group of friends. So whereas you do find, you know, these kind of community living arrangements, they're, they're evident around the world as well. Um, they're not that common for that obvious reason. They're, you know, as I said, they're a great idea to think about. They were quite difficult to set up. Do you set them up as strata titled, community title, company title? You've got all those arrangements in there. Lois, if you were going to do one big thing to try and reform this sector, just one, what might it be? I think if we're going for a one big thing, in a lot of cases, we need to look more at the housing supply and the appropriateness of housing supply. It's one thing to say we should increase housing supply, we need to zone more land on the fringes of the CBD. We need to increase the supply of age-appropriate housing in communities where people want to live. So making that a, you know, a, a more easily available. As I mentioned, when people choose to downsize, there may not be available appropriate stock for them to downsize to. Be able to increase the supply of this type of housing in a variety of locations would be ideal. Lois Tower, thanks for having a chat. Thank you, my pleasure. Coming up next on The Context, imagine paying the same for one of these as one of these. It once happened, but there's more to the story. Come with me. Financial pundits have been warning the boom in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are a speculative investment bubble to rival the Dutch tulip mania of the 1630s. When it's spring again, I'll bring again tulips from Amsterdam. I think it's the biggest bubble since tulip mania. An entire business could be bought with them, the entire country. It was, of course, tulip mania, and then the prices crashed. Tulip mania also pops up in economics textbooks all the time as well. Often economists know the name, but they don't know very much more about them. And I think there's something about tulips that grabs the imagination, the idea that these things could be really worth a lot of money. But beyond that, People don't go into the depths of what tulip mania actually was very often. That's Dr Helen Paul, an economic historian at the University of Southampton who specialises in financial bubbles. But according to a top expert on the subject, the Dutch tulip mania wasn't quite as reported for almost 400 years. Virtually everything that people have said about it, I think, is is wrong, but the, the myth persists. That's Anne Goldgar, Professor of European History at the University of Southern California and author of the book Tulip Mania. The usual things that people say about tulip mania focus on kind of disbelief that anybody would want to pay a lot of money for a tulip bulb and also the idea that the whole Netherlands went crazy for tulips and, and spent all their money on it, that the country um, went into the depression because of it, that people went bankrupt and committed suicide and so on. And what I found was basically that none of that was true. She says there's no evidence to support claims that ordinary Dutch people like weavers and peasants and farmers were trying to make a fast fortune buying and selling tulips on the streets of Amsterdam. Which is not to say that nothing weird happened. Some tulips certainly got very, very expensive for a while there. In a handful of cases, tulip buyers paid 300 Dutch guilders for a single bulb. And what else would 300 guilders get you in the 1630s? You could buy a, sm a small house for it. OK, that is a lot for a tulip bulb. But Anne Goldgar's research revealed rational economic drivers 
behind those inflated prices and a distinct lack of mania. Tulips were at that time uh, very fashionable, a subject of considerable interest uh, to a lot of people. And like the price of anything, they go up and down depending on the demand. And so the fact that the demand was high was um, uh, a very good reason for prices to rise, perhaps not so precipitously as they did in uh, the middle of the 1630s or fall as they did. Um, but to me, that was not an irrational event. Helen Paul agrees it was more market than manic. Well, I would say it's a luxury good market because the variegated tulips were an imported product that frankly, they just didn't have. These are some kind of special flowers and we might think nothing of spending a lot of money on a rare orchid, but tulips have been bred to the point that they've become very common and we've forgotten how amazing they were when the Dutch first saw them. So if the tulip mania wasn't really an example of some kind of hysterical mass delusion, are there better examples of investment bubbles to help us understand cryptocurrencies? We could certainly look at the South Sea and Mississippi bubbles. So we have a bubble year of 1720 where the French market crashes and then the London market crashes and there's also some volatility elsewhere. So that looks much more like a modern financial crash. Like a lot of stories we've told ourselves for centuries, the moral is what matters and the reason why they're retold and mythologised. Although Anne Goldgar says the moral lesson often taken from tulip mania is a rather elitist one. Weavers and poor people who actually weren't particularly involved in this but were getting blamed for it. Weavers shouldn't be involved with uh, buying tulips because they don't they need to stay in their place. They shouldn't be um, making money without having to do any work for it. That's the morality tale that we hear. Well, Helen Paul says there is a good lesson for ordinary investors. If you're dealing with something that is pretty cutting edge, you don't want to start interfering in that because by the time it's hit the papers, any big gains will probably have been made by somebody else. So by all means, you can invest in something reasonably risky if you've got a diversified portfolio, but you can't mimic the behaviour of big players. And a reminder that any financial advice is general in nature, whether it relates to shares, investments, tulips or cryptocurrencies. For the day I know we can Share these tulips from Amsterdam Share these tulips and that is all the time we have for the context this week. I'm John Barron. Thanks for watching. See you next time.